1920, Italian designers Elena and Enrico Scavini created what would become one of the most popular collectibles in interwar Europe, the Lenchi doll. Intended for play as well as display, pressed felt Lenchi dolls with their realistic mohair, meticulously painted faces, and durably sewn wardrobes were renowned for their attention to detail and for their quality craftsmanship. Some Lenchi dolls, especially those that were part of the firm's prestigious boudoir collection, were never really intended as children's toys, but were sold to adults to decorate their homes. Two of Lenchi's earliest portrait boudoir dolls were luminaries of the Paris stage, Miss Stenguet in 1924 and Josephine Baker in 1926. Although not the only famous figures to re be reproduced as Lenchi dolls, Miss Stinget and Baker deserve special attention. Popular performers whose unique voices could be heard on the radio and in sound recordings, Miss Stinget and Baker were also consummate entertainers, dynamic performers who dominated the Paris stage and mesmerized audiences on screen. As fashion icons, moreover, their glamorous images graced magazine covers, enlivened boulevard posters, peppered Morris columns, and appeared in advertisements for everything from spirits to skin cream. As performers, as saleswomen, and as cover girls, Mistinget and Baker became literal and figurative dolls of the Grand Review. It is in this capacity, I argue, that they enable us to investigate the commodification of celebrity in 1920s France. The Mistinget and Baker Lenchi dolls thus provide a point of departure for thinking about intersections between the production of celebrity and the rise of mass consumer culture. Rather than locate the origins of modern celebrity in the studio star system that emerged in Hollywood in the 1930s and 1940s, as most scholars since the 1970s have done, I trace it instead to the vibrant music halls of 1920s Paris. Here as entertainers, entrepreneurs, and perhaps especially as living dolls, Miss Stinget and Baker embodied the myriad ways that celebrity was racialized, gendered, and commoditized, and they fashioned a model of female stardom that would be emulated throughout the 20th century. During her long career in the music hall, Miss Stinget meticulously managed the commodification of her methodically fashioned body. Although conspicuous for her over-the-top feathered headdresses, as you see here, which often span several feet into the air and weighed as much age costumes were designed to show off her most alluring and marketable physical asset, her legs. My legs, Miss Stinget once extolled, the word is out. People have talked about my legs ever since I became Miss Stinget. More than any other feature, costume, or indeed role, Miss Stinget's celebrity was associated with her legs. And for her part, Miss Stinget recognized their centrality to her star image. I had to invent everything, she extolled. Even my legs, the loveliest in the world, came out of my head. That's why the world came to look at them. Miss Stinget openly addressed the popular fascination with her legs in her 1930s co-authored tell-all, Miss Stinget and Her Confessions. In one essay in the collection, she acknowledged that she had given her legs a good deal of consideration. In 1920, the latest edition of La Russe contained under the heading Legs, an article which began. The legs served to carry the trunk, but like the columns of antiquity, singularly embellish the edifice they support, she wrote coyly. Like La Rue's, I think that a woman devoid of harmonious legs is nothing but an inelegant animal. I would not have the temerity to describe my legs. I don't think I could if I tried. I know them too well or not well enough. Besides, I have never seen them as others see them. Miss Stinget's legs undeniably held tremendous commercial value. Throughout her career, but especially during her time in the Grand Review, photographs, posters, and other publicity materials blatantly featured them. 
Miss Stangett not only permitted the brazen fetishization of her legs, she actively encouraged it. They have done me well, she admitted. In 1919, I insured them for 500,000 francs, the cost of a house on the Champs-Élysées. Miss Stangett understood that people came to the review not just to be entertained, but also to visually and virtually consume expensive jewels, ostentatious costumes, and extraordinary female bodies. Audiences thus demanded the glamorous props of life, as she called them, that only the music hall could offer. Part commodified erotic spectacle, part talented entertainer, part astute businesswoman, Miss Stingett used her legs to curate a celebrity brand in which the product and producer became indivisible. By the time she reached the peak of her review career in the mid-1920s, Miss Stingett knew well how to capitalize on the commercial value of her brand. From early in her career, she had peddled soaps, silk stockings, jewelry, furs, and liquor for French firms. Eager to cash in on her increasingly international notoriety, American firms doggedly pursued her to endorse toothpaste, deodorants, creams, shampoos, cornflakes, hair curlers, aspirins, and sewing machines. While overwhelmed by the prospect of lending her name to such a vast array of consumer products, it was the last, the request to recommend sewing machines that ultimately proved too much. Caught between the soap men and the face cream men, as she mockingly called them, Miss Stingett had little desire to sell clean well soap or smell good cream or niff nice talc, even though doing so would have doubled her dollar capital. In an effort to win her over, one American publicist went so far as to favorably compare her to Sarah Bernhardt. He claimed that her endorsement would appeal to the great American public who, though it did not necessarily know what she did, recognized her name. You, he told her, are Miss Dinguette. You are Paris. People call their pet dogs after you. They're canaries. They're goldfish. You are a personality. You are a being, an entity, a symbol, and a symbol is all. Whether or not Miss Dinguette sought to embody Paris for the great American public or to be commemorated in the names of family pets, she ultimately rejected the publicist's offer, refusing to endorse products that she, quote, did not like. Although Miss Stingett claims to have rebuffed the American's proposal, by the time he made his pitch in the 1930s, the die had well been cast. Miss Stingett was a recognizable product endorser in Europe and America. Her face, like her legs, sold the public products it did or did not need, that she did or did not like. The star had created her brand, and her brand became an international commodity. If Miss Stingett's commercial appeal resided in her quintessential Parisian Frenchness, then Josephine Baker's was inextricably bound with her distinctive african Americanness. Baker first traveled to Paris with her dance troupe from Harlem in 1925. She became an overnight sensation, notorious for her frenetic bodily movements and her ability to bring American jazz music to life for French audiences. A year later, she performed what would become her famous banana dance for the first time at the Folies Bergère. In what would become the show's most talked about number, Baker gyrated suggestively in a skirt made of only rubber bananas. Bananas, because of their facile phallic comparisons, had long been used as music hall props, especially in comedic scripts. So while Baker's use of them as a stage costume was not itself peculiar, the meaning of those bananas acquired a new resonance when adorning the black female body. Playing to entrenched European fantasies of the hypersexualized black female and reinforcing ideas of racial difference by perpetuating stereotypes of the quote, wild African, Baker's provocative routine titillated French audiences. But it also serendipitously ser uh, engaged spectators in an international conversation about sex, race, and nationality in the modern age of celebrity. 
Indeed, Baker capitalized upon the primitive banana girl image, making it a signature of her professional brand and transforming it into a lucrative marketing scheme. For their part, French manufacturers mass produced a pudding called Custard Josephine Baker. Stickers publicizing the movie Zuzu, in which Baker again performed the number, were distributed to Parisian fruit vendors to put on the bananas that they had for sale. And Baker herself advised women on how to make homemade banana moisturizers to fight wrinkles. In these ways, bananas enabled the star to exploit European stereotypes for professional and financial gain at the same time that they signify Baker's own commodification within the modern marketplace of celebrity. Even as Baker parodied the primitive woman on stage, she embodied the modern woman in real life. Muscular and disciplined, Baker's athletic body provided a suitable mannequin for post-war French fashions. Paul Poiret dressed her throughout 1925 and 1926. That Baker was a jazz dancer only solidified her association with the fashionable avant-garde. In Baker, Terry Gordon explains, one saw a mirror of modernity, a reflection of its palpitating rhythm, its perpetual movement, its ephemeral and fleeting nature. If jazz was the hallmark of modernity, then the jazz dancer was by definition completely a la mode. Yet another way that Baker signified the modern was her adoption of the bob hairstyle. Whereas the look could have simply reinforced her racial otherness, in the 1920s it created common ground between the performer and her French female counterparts. Baker not only provided a model for how to wear the trendy crop cut, but she also manufactured and successfully sold hair care products to white women. French consumers clamored for Baker Fix pomade which promised to retain curl, to tame wayward locks, and implicitly to help the user achieve the Baker look. This product was so popular, in fact, that advertisements for it ran not only in women's magazines like Vogue and Votre Beauté, but also in mainstream dailies like Le Figaro and Le Journal. Interestingly, in contrast to advertisements created to publicize her stage performances and later her films, Baker Fix ads rarely revealed any part of Baker's body below the shoulder, focusing rather on the hair where the product would be applied and on her face, thereby associating her image with her product. Baker Fix ads called attention not to a dancer's raw sexuality, but to a black woman's fashionable beauty. That French women purchased commodities bearing Baker's name and image especially those dedicated to enhancing the female body, suggested they accepted La Béguerre, or simply Our Josephine, as they endearingly called her, as a desirable model of modern womanhood. If Mestinguet and Baker were already accomplished self-promoters and established stars, how then do we understand their cultural relevance and commercial significance as lynchy dolls? In other words, why is it noteworthy that two figurative dolls of the Grand Review should become literal dolls? As I have already suggested, through brand creation, product endorsements, and their manipulation of star as commodity, both Mistinget and Baker actively navigated international commercial markets while establishing their places in the global marketplace of celebrity. They did so in part by reinforcing and challenging the regulatory norms of gender, sexuality, and race operating in Western Europe and in North America during the interwar years. But their success also stemmed from their keen awareness of how to manipulate modern celebrity itself. They knew that their star quality derived as much from their public visibility, personal desirability, and perceived accessibility as from their talents. In the Lenchy dolls then, Mistinget and Baker appear to have come full circle, literally becoming a purchasable product, an object of exchange available for private ownership, and an item to be acquired by the great mass of fans eager to possess them. As Edward Berenson and Yves Galois have explained in their work on fame and charisma, 
The consumption and manipulation of material culture was especially vital in allowing fans to live out their celebrity identifications. To actually possess a Lynchy Mistanguette or a Lynchy Baker then brought fans closer to their idols collapsing the imaginative space between stardom and everyday life, offering even the most ordinary person a bit of celebrity. As literal and figurative dolls of the Grand Review, Miss Dingett and Baker also, in the words of Michael Garvel, anticipated the paradoxical place of celebrated feminine beauty within our mass visual culture, between commodification and creative self-fashioning, exploitation, and empowerment. Both women embodied a new image-driven brand of celebrity that intertwined exceptionality and ubiquity, transcendence and common currency, with celebrity as the new opiate of the people. Miss Dingett and Baker attached their names and their images to consumer products, from films and records to cosmetics and dolls. And in so doing, they entered into the homes of ordinary people penetrating the lives of individuals as well as the collective imagination. They also provided a model of female celebrity that would span the 20th century. Thank you.